Operations has always been at the core of every business. Throughout history, we have seen three revolutions transform the way we do business. The fourth revolution is happening now. Technology is ubiquitous. Everyone can access everything all the time. And new technologies are accelerating change. Operations will cease to be delivered by humans. Managing an augmented workforce with new skills comprising millennials, crowdsourced experts, and automated agents requires a new approach. Cognitive tools can now make faster and often better decisions than humans. They can learn from customer interactions and provide a more tailored service. The abundance and transparency of data has led to empowered customers, providing an array of opportunities and risks. Every customer has a unique set of expectations and demands personalized service. Businesses must collaborate both internally with existing teams and externally, building alliances and partnerships. Customer service must be a team sport. Cost has always been a priority, but now must be balanced with other competing demands, such as investment in new technologies, engaging customers in new ways, and corporate social responsibility. But these investments are key to growth. Investments in innovation have fundamentally transformed supply chains, providing businesses with the opportunity to reimagine what they deliver by delivering it differently. Unprecedented geopolitical changes, risk, and regulation are forcing businesses to rethink their operations and redesign their operating models and platforms, both locally and globally. Everything is changing. So is your role. Wherever you want to start or continue your journey, we can help. Reorganize your operations around customer journeys. Optimize your global networks and build partnerships, not just to reduce cost, but also to enhance propositions. Leverage your augmented workforce and identify opportunities for automation. Redefine your cost structure so you can reinvest for growth, reinvest for customer experience, reinvest for transformation, reinvest for the future. The change, it's already happening. Are you leading it? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the digital age. My name is Peter Moller. I've been chairing this event since 1997. And I can safely say that in all that time, the pace of change has never been as great as it is now. And that change is fueled by the advent of various digital technologies, disruptive digital technologies. And the call that we heard at the end of that video, the change is already happening. Are you leading it? That wasn't specifically meant for shared services leaders, but it might just as well have been, because I think it's very relevant. We all as shared services leaders need to take our organizations into the digital age. So let me ask you, the change that's already happening, when it comes to shared services moving into the digital age, are you leading that change? Hands up, who thinks they're leading that change? Because I think right now, we're a key moment in shared services evolution, and you have a key uh, decision to make. You can either lead that change and play a part in the future of your shared service organization, make sure it's very relevant going forward and has a meaningful role, or you can sit back and see what happens with the obvious risk that someone else determines your future. And it might not be a future you particularly like, and it might not be a future in which your shared services organization stays relevant to the wider organization. So I know which of those decisions I think I would take and I think you should take. And one thing I want to do in the next 40 minutes or so is talk about my vision of what shared services could look like in a digital age. What would digital business services look like? One of the reasons I want to do that is that last year in the conference, the feedback we got from you, the top topic that you wanted to find out more about was digital business services and how you can move to a digital business services organization and take your shared service organization to that place. 
So I'm going to be focusing a little bit on that. I always think with conferences like this, um, there are kind of two reasons people come along. One of them is to, is to get insight like that, insight into the future, what digital business services might look like. Uh, find out what other leading organizations are doing, what leading practices are, learn from what's going on out there, what's cutting edge. And we're certainly going to help you with that. We've got an unbelievable lineup of speakers to talk through, and they're all leading their organizations into the digital age. And the second area, the second area is networking, expanding your network of peers, and reconnecting with old friends. Uh, and if you look in the audience here today, we've got something like 1,000 people connected with the shared services space. Uh, I mean, a quick show of hands. Who here, who here works primarily in finance shared services area? OK. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about the HR shared services area? Quite a few in HR. People who would say they're primarily focused, uh, attached to uh, IT? IT people here? OK. Uh, and who here would say they're in part of a GBS organization? You can put your hand up twice. Who, who affiliates to a GBS organization? OK. Uh, who's just realized they're at the wrong event? <laughs> the exhibition on uh, contemporary Chinese art, that's, that's next door. The clue should have been a total absence of Chinese art in this hall. Apart from perhaps the logo for the conference, which, uh, which looks a little bit confusing. Uh, actually, if there are anyone from, who wanted to be in that exhibition next door, you have, a, you have a decision to make as well. And that's, do you get up and leave right now, which would be slightly embarrassing, or do you just sweat it out until the first break and try and bluff that you're a shared services person? I leave that choice to you. Um, so, but I can help you a little bit with the networking, perhaps. I'm going to make sure that everyone goes home and has met at least one new contact, one new person. Um, it, it seems to me that the, uh, the key barrier to networking at events like this is that people don't always feel comfortable saying hi and introducing themselves to someone they don't know. Uh, maybe this goes back to when we were sort of three-year-old toddlers and our parents said, you shouldn't talk to strangers, you know. Um, I, I don't know, but what I can say is this is a safe place. This is a very safe space. There are no weirdos here. OK, I have seen one or two. <laughs> It's a pretty safe space. So, so what we're going to do, I'm going to give you the chance to start this networking. It's a warm-up exercise for your networking muscles. What you're going to do when I say go is you're going to introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you, hopefully someone you don't know. If there's someone you do know, introduce yourself to someone you don't know. And you're going to say who you are, who you work for, what your role is. And then you're going to say, what is the one thing you'd really like to learn more about over the next couple of days? What's that learning opportunity for you? And the other person is then going to share whether they have any specific expertise in that area. And then you're going to swap it around. You've just got two minutes and your time. And if you need to work in threes, that's fine. Your time starts now. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Plenty of time for networking later today and tomorrow. Thank you. So uh, were there any perfect matches? Were there any areas that uh, was someone's opportunity for learning and the other's area of expertise? Any, any perfect matches here? OK. One or two, yeah. So um, well, hopefully you can follow up on those during the day and tomorrow. So, so last year, and I know most of you weren't here last year, last year I kicked off with a story, a really good example of what happens if you don't lead the change and if you wait to see what happens and someone else does change. And, and the example I gave was the Blockbuster and Netflix story, which is a really interesting one. Uh, I mean, Blockbuster, everybody know Blockbuster? You have Blockbuster out here? Blockbuster was the giant in its video rental space. It had 9,000 stores, 60,000 people, the, most, the largest and most profitable video renter. It had the opportunity in the year 2000 to buy Netflix for $50 million. Okay? And at the time, the CEO of Blockbuster looked at it and said, no, we don't think it's value. We don't think they're a serious threat to our business. They're not a serious competitor. And they turned the offer down. Um, Netflix obviously went on to be extremely successful. Blockbuster went bust in 2010. Netflix, when I told this story last year, was worth $85 billion. 
I looked yesterday, and it was worth about 150 billion, which is 3,000 times more than Blockbuster could have bought it for. And the reason that Netflix took over is because it adopted a digital business model, and Blockbuster had an analog business model. And Netflix offered far better convenience, far better customer experience at a fraction of the cost. And I think it's an interesting analogy to see what can happen if you stand still and others don't stand still. But some people may say, well, yeah, that's video streaming, video rental. I mean, that's not really the business we're in. But I think it's interesting to look at other businesses because you're not always going to learn best practices, leading practices from your own sector, from other shared service organizations, although you can learn a lot. So maybe we look at another industry. And one I had a chance of looking at recently um, is the insurance sector. Uh, in fact, I was, I was on the beach in Spain just a few weeks ago, enjoying the last rays of the summer sun. And I got a, I got a WhatsApp message yeah, from a friend of mine in London, Melissa. And, and I looked at the message, and she sent a picture. And this was the picture she sent. And I looked at it, and I thought, hang on, that's where I live. That's my road. And then I, I looked again, and I thought, hang on, that's my car. <laughs> I didn't have my reading glasses. I was on the beach, you see. There's nothing wrong with my eyes. It's just my arms aren't long enough. <laughs> I looked again. I thought, what the hell's happened to my car? And then there was some text. So I read the text. and It said, Peter, hi. This is your car, isn't it? So I typed back and said, yes, it is my car. What the hell happened to it? It was fine three days ago when I left London. And how many people here have written off their car, have had a car write-off. And by write-off, I mean it's damaged so badly it's not repairable, it's not worth repairing. How many people? Yeah, a few people. Yeah, yeah. How many have had a car of theirs written off when they're not even in the same country? <laughs> it's pretty unlucky, isn't it? So apparently in this case, someone stole a rental car, smashed into my car, and did a runner. Luckily, they left their number plate. <laughs> Joyriders in London are not very smart, I could, it's a lucky thing. And so they were traced. But it got me looking at the insurance market. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized it was a market that was ripe for disruption. I, I mean, think about it. And I think there's some similarities here with the shared services space. Typically, insurance companies have a lot of customers. They have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of transactions. A lot of them are pretty rules-based, repetitive routine. They have a myriad of legacy systems that they have to deal with. And often, customer satisfaction levels, the customer experience, is not great. Hence, it's right for disruption. And I think if you think about those, those factors, there's some similarities with the shared services space. Incidentally, the most annoying thing about this, bizarrely enough, was I just put new windscreen wipers on two days before I left London, and I hadn't even used them. That's 30 euros I'm not getting back. But anyway, so when it comes to disruption, as a result of this, there are quite a few disruptors coming into the market, into the insurance market right now. And one I think is worth looking at a bit closer is a company called Lemonade, who have entered the space in the, U in the US, in New York, and they're now planning to come to Europe. And they made an interesting observation. They thought that there was a fundamental conflict in the business model, in the insurance business model, whereby insurance companies are not incentivized to pay out the claims that the customers want. If they pay, the more claims they pay out, the less profit they make. So they thought there was an opportunity. And they also looked at the technology that's being used, and they thought there was an opportunity to improve it significantly. And in fact, this, this intrigued me. And I, I thought I'd look a bit closer. Um, and this idea that there's poor satisfaction because there's a fundamental conflict in the business model. I thought I'd look at the Urban Dictionary. People know the Urban Dictionary? This is the, the most frequently used online dictionary um, that you can find on the internet. And what, it's like a crowdsourced thing. That's the most popular definition is voted on and, and gets to the top. This is the top definition. You can check this. It's the top definition for insurance as voted on on the internet. Insurance is a business that involves selling people promises to pay later that are never fulfilled. <laughs> and helpfully, they give an example to bring this sort of definition to life. And the example given, again, the top definition on, the, on, on this website, um, the example given is Goma paid flood insurance premium for years, but then the insurer de decided to go out of business when the flood came because management had spent all the premium on hookers and private jets. <laughs> so 
yeah, so, so maybe there is something about this conflict in the business model. And, and I got sucked into the insurance process. I had to fill out a claims form. I had to fill that box out that says, describe in your own words what happened. And I thought, well, I wonder what others have written in that box. And again, I did some research and had a look. And, and I found various entries. And these, again, these are all true entries. What people had written, what actually written in that box that says, describe in your own words what happened. Coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree I don't have. <laughs> Another one, I started to slow down, but the traffic was more stationary than I thought. <laughs> Another one, windscreen broken, cause unknown, probably voodoo. <laughs> Another one here, going to work at 7 a.m. this morning, I drove out of my drive straight into a bus. The bus was five minutes early. I don't know why I'm doing these all in the same accent. It's not the same person. These are all different people, OK? Um, and the next one here, the claimant in this next one had collided with a cow, OK? The questions and answers on that claim form were as follows. Question, what warning was given by you? Answer, horn. <laughs> Question, all right, let me get to the end of the joke, will you? Question, what warning was given by the other party? Answer, moo. <laughs> OK, and, and, and here. Question, this is another one. Could either driver have done anything to avoid the accident? Answer, traveled by bus. <laughs> and finally, this, this one, this is quite sad, this one. The accident was caused by me waving to the man I hit last week. <laughs> so uh, I promise you I didn't make those up. Those are actually uh, claim forms that had been written. So, OK, let's have a look at this lemonade and how they think they're disrupting the market and what they're going about doing. And when you watch this video, I want you to think about three things, three very important areas of technology. Uh, and these are the sort of categories that Deloitte looks at disrupt disruptive digital technologies in. One, cognitive automation, how you can speed up the process, transaction processing and so forth. So massive increase in speed through cognitive automation. Secondly, cognitive engagement, how you can improve the customer experience using technology, chatbots and so forth. And thirdly, cognitive insight, how you can use information and data, draw in implications out of it, make decisions using, using digital technology, cognitive insight. So take a look and see what you think. Can we run the uh, Lemonade video, please? Was that an insurance company saying, get paid and go party in the... Uh, yeah. By the way, can I just uh, a call out to Steelcase for providing the furniture over the next couple of days? The furniture you see on stage and in the foyer and, and upstairs is all provided by, by Steelcase, who've just kitted out our new London office. So thank you very much, uh, Steelcase. Um, so, so looking at those three areas I mentioned, cognitive automation, I think you'll see from that video how quick that process is. They pay 25% of claims in three seconds or less. 
that's pretty quick compared to my insurance, which I'm still sort of haggling over. That seems pretty quick to me. Secondly, cognitive engagement, the customer experience. I don't know about you, but for me, that, that looks a bit different to most insurance companies. That looks a lot better. I kind of like the look at that. I'm, I'm looking forward to these guys coming to Europe. Customer satisfaction levels are 4.75 out of 5, which again seems pretty high for the sector. Thirdly, you may not sort of see that, but every time someone puts a claim in, there are 18 anti-fraud algorithms that work out whether that claim is likely to be fraudulent or not. And, and if it's a high probability of being fraudulent, obviously humans take over and they look into it. But Again, I, you look at this and you may think, well, yeah, well, that's the insurance industry. But think about what these lemonade guys, and by the way, these lemonade guys, they're not insurance guys. They, they are specialists in technology, in AI, in behavioral economics. They, did, they, don't, they don't know the insurance industry. What would it look like if these guys came and take a look at shared services organizations and try to apply some of this thinking to a shared service organization? I think that's uh, an interesting question. And actually, so let's look at the shared services market. What I want to do is to use a similar lens, if you like, to those three areas we just used to look at this and look at the, uh, the shared service market and think about what digital business services might look like and how you might take your, your shared service organizations and turn them into digital business services organizations. So I want to look at three areas. One is service delivery. This is the engine room. This is where, you know, this is the heart of shared services, where it all started 20 years ago in Europe with companies like HP and Whirlpool, transaction processing. Secondly, the customer experience, as we said, how can you make the customer experience just a lot better, not just for external customers, but for su external suppliers, other stakeholders, employees, um, shared service operatives, and so forth. And thirdly, value creation. I'm going to talk about how important this is, because if you just stop at the first two, it's not going to be a great place to be over the next 10, 20 years. So first of all, the engine room, service delivery. Let me ask a question. Does anybody still here have humans processing transactions? Anyone? Anyone still have humans? You do? I mean, isn't that a bit degrading? I think that's probably a violation of their fundamental human rights, no? <laughs> Processing transactions? What, what, what are the implications of having humans still doing this stuff? It's going to be higher cost. People cost more than machines once on an operating basis, certainly. It's not scalable. You know, think about the blockbuster model compared to the Netflix model. Netflix has doubled its valuation in the last 12 months because it's extremely scalable. It doesn't matter how many more people move onto the platform. It's extremely scalable. Higher error rates. You know, it's interesting looking at self-drive cars and there's this furore because a Tesla on self-drive killed someone. I mean, that's a tragedy, yes, but every year 1.3 million people are killed on the roads by human error. The world's going to be a, self a safer place when we're into autonomous self-drive cars. Higher error rates with humans. They make more mistakes. Finally, less data and insight. I mean, when you have processes that are automated that have robotics working on them rather than humans, there's a lot more information and data digitally kept. I, I see a lot of people taking pictures. I this side's better than this side, if it's, if it's me. If it's me. If it's the slides you're taking pictures of, all of them will be made available pretty quickly after the conference. Within, I'm looking down here, I'm looking at them. Within a day or two, you should get most of them. Two. Is that a peace sign or is that two? That's two. Oh, it was that, that was, that, was it? Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll get the slides. Um, one or two of the external speaker slides may be slightly edited. There's confidential stuff they don't want in that uh, website, but you'll get the vast majority of slides. So those are the implications. So let's, let's think about what an ideal world would look like, a world in which you didn't have all these humans doing this work. Well, first of all, you'd have a single instance ERP. This is still the basic system of record. You, you can't just go in and, and, and create a sort of whole finance and HR function based on robotics. It's still worth having the ERP. Ideally, it would be in the cloud, so it's more standard. It would have in-memory capability, computing capabilities, so you had better provision of real-time data for in information decision-making. But you'd have that fundamental block, the ERP. But it would be a single instance, and there'd be one, and you wouldn't have a myriad of them. Um, you'd then have process-specific technologies. 
So, so you know, our sponsors here today, there are a lot that fall into this category. Uh, you, you know, we've got companies like Blackline in Record to Report, uh, Trade Shift in Purchase to Pay, companies like ServiceNow that, that pull it all together and provide an integrated view for individuals using these softwares and processes. But these companies have invested millions making sure they sort out purchase to pay, order the cash, account to report, hire to retire. You know, why would you try and recreate that with robotics if there's already organizations that have done a lot of that work that's available off the shelf? So ERP, process-specific technologies, and then if you've still got some stuff around the edges, still got stuff that's, that humans are doing that needn't be because they are relatively rules-based, repetitive, routine, this is the domain. This is one of the domains for robotics, and we've seen a, a significant uptake. And again, um, just out in the hall, you can speak. The top three robotics providers are here. Automation Anywhere, again, our lead sponsors. Thank you so much for, uh, for working with us. We've got Blue Prism. We've got UiPath. Um, and we've got another organization called NICE that, that provide a lot of um, RPA and other cognitive technologies. So do go and speak to our, our sponsors. They're there because they do help you move into the digital age. You'll also have noticed, or you may have noticed as you walked up here from the ground floor, that today we're releasing our latest report, our State of the Nation report on RPA. And let me just bring you a few of the highlights. Uh, and it really has been an unbelievable journey for RPA. In the shared services space, I'd say three years ago, there was pretty much nothing happening. And now there's a lot. So let's look at the sort of the good news, if you like. Uh, last year, something like 50% of the uh, respondents said that they had uh, art robotic um, projects going on. The figure today is two-thirds, so that's gone up significantly. The satisfaction levels are extremely high. Over 90% of respondents said that they were satisfied or very satisfied in three different areas. One was the improvement in productivity. Secondly, the uh, improvement in compliance, and thirdly, the cost to implement, which are three key variables for RPA projects. 80% of respondents also said that their workforce was happier, which some people may think the workforce shouldn't like RPA because it's displacing jobs, but the stuff that the robots are doing, I don't know if there are any robots in here, but it's really boring stuff. It's dull. You know, don't let them know. They might get, start getting dissatisfied. But it's stuff that humans don't want to do. The repetitive rule, routine, rules-based stuff, humans don't want to be doing that. So the workforce is happier when it's, they're augmented through robotics. That's what we're seeing. The other bit of good news was that last year, something like 31% of the respondents felt that IT were on board, were engaged and supportive. Only 31%. That was the lowest figure of all the various stakeholders that you needed to be on board. That figure has gone up dramatically to 57%. So IT are finally getting it. They're understanding that it's a different type of technology, but it's still an extremely valuable and useful one for the organization. I guess the big concern from our perspective is that organizations are still not scaling very quickly. Last year, about 3%, only 3%, had more than 50 bots in production. We thought that figure would go up quite dramatically. It's only 4% this year. Of the 500 or so organizations that we surveyed, only 4% had more than 50 bots in production, which is a low figure. So we did a bit more digging to find out what was going on here. And we found out that there are three key factors here, three key factors. One is that the processes are fragmented. And, and the feeling is they're too fragmented to work on. There's a feeling that more standardization is required before they can really apply the RPA. Secondly, there's a lack of a top-down, organization-wide, end-to-end process vision for RPA. People are taking RPA, they're taking robots, and they're fixing at a task level, but they're not looking at the end-to-end -end process or the organizational view, and that they really need that to scale up. And finally, although the IT functions are more supportive, they're more on board, they're still not really ready. They're still not getting that robotics implementations are quite different to other implementations like ERP. They're less centralized, they're much more decentralized, and they're much quicker. RPA implementations tend to be in weeks, not months or years. So interesting, definitely get a copy. Um, you'll find on the website, there's an eminent section. Uh, the, cop the, the, the report will be there. There are about three or 400 copies we've got, so those at the back of the hall will probably be able to get them. Those at the front, you better run. Uh, don't go now, don't go now, you can wait till the break, but we have them on the Deloitte stand. 
So, so in the ideal world, if you had those three things, you really shouldn't have a need for humans in this space. But of course, we don't live in the ideal world. So let's look at uh, the world we actually live in. And it looks something like this. We have a lot of ERPs. They don't talk to each other. Organizations have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 plus different ERPs and systems that aren't necessarily very well integrated. There are a lot of non-standard processes. Even people who say they have a standard process, when you actually look at the process, it's not standard. At the desktop level, very few processes are actually standard. <coughs> There's a lot of unstructured data flying around that can't be recognized readily, certainly not by robots. Other technology can kick in there. And finally, exceptions. What people are doing typically are handling exceptions. But what you find is that these need to be fixed. These need to be looked at. You know, to move into the digital world, you, it's very difficult if you've got a lot of this going on. You need to move towards a single ERP. I know it's expensive. I know it's difficult. But if you can't, move to at least a few ERPs rather than so many. And look at using middleware or maybe RPA as, as interim solutions. You need to start standardizing your processes, your policies, your data, your technology where you can. You need to try and reduce the unstructured data where possible. Or leverage other technology. A lot of people we're seeing, they have an RPA script Upstream of the RPA process, the RPA automation, they're using natural language understanding technology, other digital technologies, to get unstructured data and feed it into the script. For example, email triage is very big out there. So there are ways of doing it. And exceptions, when it comes to exceptions, that's where you need to point your continuous improvement. Humans should not be processing transactions and resolving exceptions. What they should be doing is automating transaction processing finding the root cause of exceptions and fixing those exceptions so they don't appear, fixing the root cause of exceptions. And that's what continuous improvement needs to do. Now, at this stage, a lot of the Deloitte people in this audience, and there are probably a couple of hundred here, they're getting quite excited. They're thinking, Peter's finally got a new framework for looking at shared services. He hasn't used his eight levers slide yet. I usually use this eight levers slide. I've, I've had it for the last 10 years or so. Um, OK. The eight levers to transmit. I'm sorry, guys. This is still my favorite slide. This is still, for me, the essential toolkit for a shared services leader. And it's still valid. Uh, this will help you sort out your engine room, your service delivery capability. Eliminate, simplify, automate, standardize, consolidate, offshore, outsource, continuously improve. I won't spend long on this, but basically eliminate. Peter Drucker, the, the famous guru, once said, there's nothing more inefficient than doing efficiently that which shouldn't be done at all. And Tom Peters took a look at that, eliminated most of the words, and said, don't do stupid stuff. So if you're producing reports that no one needs or reads, stop it. If you're reconciling bank accounts and you've got more than you need, you can consolidate those bank accounts into a fewer number, go ahead and do that. If you're paying suppliers and you've got a payment run every day, why? Maybe do it once a week or every other week. Uh, if you're accounting for legal entities that actually could be completely eliminated because there's no purpose for them, either from a tax perspective or a strategic perspective, simplify your legal entity structure. So there are a lot of things you can do to manage the demand of shared services that you should certainly look at doing. Simplify. So that's eliminate. Simplify is about looking at end-to-end -end processes, optimizing on an end-to-end -end basis. Because often the problem is at the end of the process, but the, the cause is at the, at the very beginning. So if you look at order the cash, it's very difficult to fix collections problems if you've got very poor order entry. You need to look across the organization, across functions, and simplify your processes. Automate, we've talked about. And we've talked about the importance of robotics. We've talked about the importance of ERP, process-specific technologies. And there's plenty of other stuff going on out there at the moment as well. Blockchain, you'll hear a bit more about blockchain. For me, it's still early days for, for most people in this audience. Uh, we're waiting for the big industry solutions around supply chain verification or financial trading platforms uh, that organizations will then plug into. We're also waiting for the applications to be available that, for example, will offer you an, uh, an intercompany solution. I don't think it's worth people building one for themselves unless they're a very, very large organization. So, but, it, but exciting days, and down the line, it's definitely going to be uh, a, a big one. Cognitive agents, we're seeing, we're seeing quite a lot of uptake, especially in the IT help desk area and customer service, a little bit in HR, not much in, in finance so far. We're waiting again for the cost point to come down, I think, with, cognitive, with a lot of cognitive agent technologies. So, so that's the, 
that's the, uh, the engine room. Let's look at the, the customer experience, the sort of second cornerstone. Um, does any of this look familiar? Why can't I just look up? Why can't I just look this up myself? Why can't I see previous requests? Can I really not use my mobile? It really shouldn't be this hard to figure out how to use the system. Do, do these look familiar complaints, your customers? I, I, if we look, as we did with the engine room, if we look at the ideal world, we actually don't need to look at the ideal world to see what good looks like. All we need to do is to take out our cell phones and go onto a site like Amazon and spend five minutes on Amazon. You know, just think about it. You go on, you need to order something. It's very easy to use, completely intuitive. I've never had a lesson. I've never read a user manual. I know how to use all the functionality of Amazon. The screen, all the information is dedicated to me. It's personalized information. I can benchmark products I may want. I can look at previous requests. I can look at reviews of products. It takes seconds. You've got the whole thing done in a minute or two, and the delivery is made the same day or the next day. So the question is, how does that compare to the customer experience of your customers, whether they be employees or external customers or suppliers? How many people here think that they pass the Amazon test? What? None? <laughs> how long has Amazon been doing this? I, I had a look. It's not just the last two or three. It's like five, six, seven years. It's pretty much been the same. And, and plenty of other websites. How come? These guys can do it so well, and we struggle so much in the corporate environment, in the shared service environment. Why is it it's so difficult to get right? I mean, I accept that these are digital natives, that Uber and Netflix and, and so forth are digital natives. They've only been around 20 years. The trouble is, as far as your customers are concerned, employees are concerned, suppliers are concerned, that's just excuses. This is the new benchmark for customer experience. And everyone else is lagging, and we need to catch up. So let's look at how they do it. You know, how do they tick each of these boxes? And how can you start moving towards ticking these various boxes? Have a great experience, provide great insights, and have speed in all that your customers do with your services and products. How can you get there? Well, one of the things that they do is they use design thinking. Everything they do at places like Uber and Amazon and Netflix, is designed around that customer, around the customer experience, around the customer journey. They're not focused so much on process. I think within shared services, we've been so focused for so long on technology and process and standardization and productivity. And cu the customer's been a bit of an afterthought. And the stuff, all that stuff was important. But now we're realizing that other people have raised the bar so high, we've got to do better on customers. And it all starts with having empathy with our users. There was a great saying, you know, to understand a man, you need to walk a mile in his shoes. Another quote I heard on similar lines was, before you judge a man, walk a mile in his shoes. After that, who cares? He's a mile away, and you have his shoes. <laughs> that was Billy Connolly, I think. Um, so, but design thinking is, is absolutely worth looking at. And we're going to hear later this morning from Beckton Dickinson about using some of this design thinking. Tomorrow, we have some of our experts from Deloitte talking about how they're applying design thinking. Um, so it's, yes, definitely focused on empathy. It's about prototyping solutions rapidly, failing fast, re-prototyping, and then implementing. And interestingly, it's about working with all users and all relevant stakeholders. It's a wide group participation. The interesting thing, from a cultural perspective, how many organizations here have a culture, their culture, of empathy and failing fast? OK, there are one or two. But most organizations here probably don't have a failing fast em a culture. They, they have a, whatever you do, don't fail. And if you do, make sure no one realizes it was you culture, which is quite different. So there is a cultural challenge here to move into this type of thinking. So you'll hear more about design thinking today. OK. I want to turn to the third, to value creation. Now, if your vision for shared services in the digital world was pretty much restricted to the first two cornerstones, was restricted to the engine room, looking at that service delivery and automating that service delivery, and was restricted to the customer experience, creating an Amazon-like look and feel, that's great. But 
what's that going to look like? What would the vision of shared services be if that was the limit of your vision? We would be moving towards an organization, a shared services organization, where sometime in the future, not that far off, there would be two employees. There would be one human and one dog. And the human's role would be to feed the dog. And the dog's role would to make, was to make sure that the human didn't interfere with the technology. Is that the vision you want? Do you want to be a dog feeder sometime down the line? Because unless you look at value creation, what you're going to be doing is basically automating, 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 having less and less people involved, involved in transaction processing. For me, that's not a compelling vision. So we need to look at this value creation. So let's look at some of the drivers, some of the reasons, enablers for this drive. Think about it. The last one, I've already said, we have the need to redeploy people away from transactional work into more value-added work. We don't want to be dog feeders down the line. Shared services has the credibility to move beyond transactional work. If you've done the transactional work, the organization probably didn't trust you to do even that 10 years ago, but they now have trust in what you're doing. You have permission, hopefully, to move up the value chain. You see information and data from all over the organization. You see financials. You see customer information. You see supplier information. You see employee information. You've got a great opportunity with that information and data to play a much bigger role in analytics. You probably, you probably were the earliest adopter of RPA and other digital technologies. Who in their organizations were the first in shared services to start implementing RPA in the organization? Yeah, so, so many of you, probably most of you, were at the cutting edge of RPA. And as a result of that, you have better digital skills than most of the other organization. As a result of this, there are a number of areas of opportunity. First of all, you need to move beyond transaction processing. In finance, in HR, you need to look, look at business partnering. How can you support, at the very least, the data management aspects of business partnering? You know, what we're seeing is that a lot of those management accountants, for example, out there in the field, they say their roles can't be moved into shared services because, because they're, they're providing strategic decision support, but a lot of what they do is getting information, putting into spreadsheets, fiddling around with it, producing reports, analysis, and then, and only then, sitting down and making those decisions or supporting those decisions. A lot of that data management work can be moved into shared services. Using software like Anaplan, who are here, one of our sponsors today, using this, this cloud-based planning and reporting tool, Anaplan, we're seeing a lot of shared service organizations move that stuff into shared services and provide much better planning and reporting much better business partnering support. Outside of finance and HR, there are a lot of industry-specific stuff that you can do. I think we're going to hear a lot more from our next speaker, Steve McChrystal, AstraZeneca, about his ambitions and what they're doing now in shared services. What about analytics? At the very least, at the very least, you can be providing, you can be the sort of guardian of quality information that's used for analytics across the organization. But beyond that, you can become a COE for providing a lot of the skills and capabilities in analytics. Again, this is going to be a hot topic over the next couple of days. I know that. That's, that's, that's for sure. And finally, because you have been, or not finally, it's penultimately, because you have been at the heart of, uh, of uh, robotics, and because whoever starts looking at robotics typically then looks at other cognitive tools, looks at AI, looks at machine learning, looks at natural language generation, looks at blockchain, because you've had that experience, you've come down the learning curve quicker than the rest of the organization. You can play a role to make sure that you don't find in the organization you've got 10, 20, 30 different pockets starting up their own RPA work. That needs to be controlled. There's no reason why you shouldn't play a significant role as a COE for digital transformation. The final one, if you think about it, organizations here produce products and services. To get those products and services to their customers, you need to have a lot of work done in your organization. That needs to be chunked up into business processes. Those processes need to be formed somewhere, maybe onshore, nearshore, offshore, um, either captive or maybe outsourced or maybe crowdsourced, and to a certain extent automated. Who makes those decisions? about how that work's done, where it's done, who does it, how automated. Who makes that decision now? I ask people that. Most people haven't got a clue. Because in most organizations, decisions, they're not really taken. It just, it's just, it's where it's been. But if you think about it, GBS leaders are taking just those decisions when they look at new candidates for GBS. 
What is the work? How could it be packaged? What's the process? Should we do the process? Should we do all of it? Some of it should it be outsourced or captive, onshore? Knit? So maybe the GBS leaders can play a bigger role in global workforce management. Ultimately, shared services need to move from just taking out the cost of back office processing and reducing that. The focus now must be to look, take out cost across the organization as a whole and find new ways to add value to it. If you don't want to be a dog feeder moving forward, this is what I think you need to be able to do and must do. So I won't dwell on this, but there are a bunch of challenges, clearly. The skills challenge, capabilities challenge. One of our, um, we, we have a, a team here who's been working with the ICAW, Institute of Chartered Accountants England and Wales, on working out what skills are required for finance people in the digital world. And that's going to be rolled out across all chartered accountants, the 150,000 or so around, around the world. We're now taking that finance e-learning platform out to other organizations. So if you're interested, do go and see the guys about that. But certainly skills is an issue. The biggest one for me probably is, is leadership. You know, for this to happen, you need a very strong GBS leader, and you need also credibility in your GBS organization. It's no good saying we're going to be the centers for digital transformation and analytics if you can't match invoices and pay suppliers. So you need credibility and trust. You need to be able to do that stuff, and that's why the eight levers are important. You can't move beyond transaction processing if you can't do that yet. So all of these are challenges, but they're not insurmountable. So in summary, the change is happening, and I, I really believe that if you're not leading it, you need to be, because if you want to have a vision like this, a vision where you can play a meaningful role, where you can move up the value, change, value chain, and not just look at transactional work and reducing headcount, reducing headcount, reducing headcount, you need to take control, and I think you need to lead that change. Thank you very much.